subjects tonight, but we've got a great, um, great um, opportunity tonight. I'm so excited um, that everybody's here. I'm Sheffield Hale, and I'm President and CEO of the Atlanta History Center. I want to welcome everyone to the Atlanta History Center. To tonight's presentation, Remembering, Reckoning, and Healing, a conversation about the power of memory and the legacies of American slavery, featuring, featuring poet and writer Natasha Trethewey and historian David Blight. This event is sponsored by the Robertson uh, Project on Slavery, Race, and Reconciliation at the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, and presented in partnership with the Atlanta History Center. We provide the space and they brought the talent. That's the way it works. Um, after just a, um, we're grateful to have the opportunity to host this event and welcome back Natasha Trefway and David Blight. They've been here m many times and if maybe one or two more times each, they'll get the five timers jacket um, <laughs> that we're so well known for here. Um, in 2016, the Atlanta History Center has, since then, we've been investigating the legacy of Confederate monuments and memorials in the public landscape. This research in our large Civil War archival and artifact collection has led to broader discussion about the legacy of American Civil War and the institution of slavery, which ended, which it ended on our country today. Given the two people on the stage tonight, it's only appropriate that we mention our Atlanta History Center's newest project in the area, and that's about our film Monument, the untold story of Stone Mountain. If you're lucky, Woody will plug it for, for me, and um, well, I'm gonna leave that off for tonight. But go see it, and we have um, QR codes, it's on our website. It was, it was on WAB, it'll be on GPB, and hopefully nationwide on um, PBS, coming to a um, PBS station near you. Um, we're working on that. Um, now, I'd like to welcome the Francis S. Pauling, Professor of American History at the University of the South and the director of the Robertson Project, Woody Register, to introduce tonight's featured authors. Woody has been teaching at the University of the South since 1992, focusing on 19th and 20th century American society, culture, popular culture, and gender. In addition to his teaching, he is curator and author of multiple books and publications. Thank you all for being here this evening, and please join me in welcoming Woody Register, David Blight, and Natasha Trethewey. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that introduction, Sheffield. It's great to be here. It's great to be here at the place that made the video monument. I recommend it to everyone I see. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is true. All of my friends say, you've already recommended that movie to me. You don't have to do it again. So, uh, believe me though, check it out. Um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight. And um, especially after all the time and work it took for us at Sewanee to get here. I believe that uh, we first began talking about this event two years ago. So Sheffield and your colleagues have been most welcoming, they've been uh, encouraging, and they have especially been patient with us. And I hope this tonight is just the start of something really good between us going forward. So thank you. Uh, our locations, Sewanee and, and Atlanta History Center are, are 180 plus miles apart, but the paths that we are traveling these days run side by side. So it is good to be here, and thank you for being part of the, the events this weekend. I want to thank, too, all of you who have joined us tonight for this rare opportunity to hear from our two guests, Natasha Trethewey and David Blight. Uh, if I may explain just a little bit about why a bunch of Tennesseans are here in Atlanta, I direct, as, uh, uh, as Sheffield said, I direct the Roberson Project on Slavery, Race, and Reconciliation at the University of the South, which all of us call Sewanee, and you may know it that way too. Uh, in July 2017, the Roberson Project was launched uh, to investigate our university's investments, financial, uh, political, and spiritual uh, in slavery and its history with slavery's legacies in the century after emancipation. 
So why are we here in Atlanta tonight? Well, two years ago, we received a Legacies of American Slavery grant from the Council of Independent Colleges uh, and the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. Our part of the grant tasked us with developing programs that engage the public on the subject of civil war and lost cause commemoration and memory. Tonight's event is a kind of culminating part of that project. But why are we at Suwannee the ones doing this? It has a little bit to do with our own institution's history. The leaders of the Southern Episcopal Church launched our university in the late 1850s to become the intellectual, cultural, and religious fortress for the South's civilization of bondage, an academic line of defense against anti-slavery, and a servant to the expansion of slavery beyond its existing horizons. They envisioned a great university for, in their words, the land of the sun and the slave. Nearly 300 men and some women, themselves the enslavers of more than 40,000 persons in 1860, answered the church's call and pledged a massive fortune to endow the University of the South. And then for well more than a century after emancipation and the Civil War, Suwannee's roots in the antebellum slaveocracy and the Confederacy were the institution's pride and joy. Today, though, we are charting a different history going forward. Our governing board has issued a formal rejection of our past veneration of the lost cause and the Confederacy and has committed us to an urgent process of institutional truth-telling and reckoning. So tonight's conversation about remembering, reckoning, and healing is, as the title indicates, part of that reckoning. And we are grateful to Natasha Trethewey and David Blight for joining us in that urgent process. Uh, a large number of you out in the audience tonight, some 50 or more of you, are here to participate tomorrow uh, in a teach-in that the Robeson Project is staging here at Atlanta, at Atlanta History Center, uh, where we are recruiting participants. In this case, we have uh, 50 or more people, uh, students, faculty, archivists, librarians. Um, all are here to, uh, to learn about a database project a web-based web project that the Roberson um, Project is developing to catalog and to make publicly known all of the, as many as we can, of the Confederate and Lost Cause memorials on college campuses, not in public spaces like town squares, but, uh, but in the pristine halls of academe. Um, so we, we welcome them to, uh, to learn about this project and to join us, it has been, uh, uh, in its pilot phase for the last uh, nine months, and we're very excited uh, to open it up to new collaborators and participants over the next year as we seek to have a better understanding of how the lost cause influenced higher education in the South and how higher education influenced and supported the lost cause. That's the business part. Uh, but now I get the, I have the special pleasure of introducing our guests uh, and trying to summarize the accolades that they have learned, earned, which are so numerous and impressive as to defy summary. So I have to apologize in advance for my too abbreviated introduction. Natasha Trethewey, I am certain, needs no introduction to the people of Atlanta and especially from the likes of me, but please be charitable as I try to do justice, however incomplete, to her brilliant career as a writer of poetry and prose and a voice that both demands and shows a way toward a reckoning with America's ongoing historical record of racist violence and white supremacy. Natasha Trethewey has published five collections of poetry Monument in 2018, and which I brought for her to sign, if she will, tonight, was long listed for the National Book Award. And Native Guard in 2006 was awarded the Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize. She served two terms as the 19th Poet Laureate of the United States. 
Her nonfiction includes Beyond Katrina, a meditation on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, published in 2010, and as we all must know, Memorial Drive, a daughter's memoir, published in 2020. Natasha Trethway has held fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and many other, and other foundations, and she has received well more than 20 honors and, and awards, including the Rebecca Johnson Bobbitt National Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry from the Library of Congress. And if I, you know, uh, may be a little selfish here, she delivered the memorable Haynes Lecture at Sewanee this past fall. She's been elected to the American Academies of Arts and Letters and of Arts and Sciences, and to the Board of Chancellors of the Academy of American Poets. She received her BA from the University of Georgia, an MA in English and Creative Writing from Hollins University, and her MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As many of you know, she taught uh, in the English and Creative Writing Program at Emory University for 15-ish years. And today, she is the Board of Trustees Professor of English in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. Sitting, uh, sitting immediately to her right is David W. Blight, whose online biography describes him as a teacher, scholar, and public historian. And that is precisely what he is. At the moment, he is Sterling Professor of History at Yale University, where he joined the faculty in 2003 after teaching 13 years uh, at Amherst College. He also directs the Gilder Lehrman Center, one of the great laboratories of research and collegial, collegial collaboration uh, in the world today. He is a graduate of Michigan State University, and he received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But spend any time with him and you will learn and be able to tell uh, the imprint that teaching seven years in a public high school in his hometown of Flint, Michigan has left on him. He is a natural born teacher. David Blight has twice won the Bancroft Prize, which is the highest accolade in the field of American history, and the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize. First, for his pathbreaking book in 2001, Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, and more recently, for his biography of Frederick Douglass, entitled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which also won the Pulitzer Prize. There are many other books to note, including edited collections, but I underscore Professor Blight's importance in recovering and bringing back into print and life, restoring to our heritage in many ways, the words and voices and experiences of African-American writers of the 19th century. David Blight's been elected to, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He serves on the board of museums and historical societies. He's a frequent contributor, a must-read contributor, I would say, to leading publications like the New York Times and Washington Post. And those of us with the Roberson Project have had the very good fortune to work with him and his talented staff at the Gilder Levin Center, thanks to the Legacies Grant I mentioned earlier. So if you were to wish for any two people on whom to eavesdrop, as I talked about the residue to de left today by the devastating devastation wrought by the historical storms of slavery, Jim Crow, and white supremacy, any two people to talk about Americans' ability to remember and forget the ways in which we are caught up in this history, any two people to talk about the hope of dreaming and working toward another future one that's safer and more just for all who dwell here. We would want those two people to be our guests tonight, and lucky for us, they are. So please join me in welcoming Natasha Trethaway and David Blight. carrying too many books tonight, too. Typical academic. There we are. Yes, that does work. So we're, uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to toss out uh, a few 
few questions and talk more so, uh, softly too. And, uh, and allow our guests to do the talking or to do virtually all of the talking so you don't have to listen to me. But I wanted to, if I could get us started, find my notes here. Um, I wonder if we could talk whether about, here's my question. Are we at an extraordinary moment um, of artistic and cultural creat creativity uh, in this country? One that is tragically related to the uh, extraordinary violence that has uh, uh, against black people over the last, well, certainly over the last uh, eight to 10 years. Is, would you think, do you think that this is a moment of, un, of unusual artistic and cultural creativity that's attributable to the renewed attention to race in American history and life? Do you have any thoughts about that? I certainly think that, um, and I want to speak particularly about poetry for a moment, that um, among the poets who are writing today, especially this young, newer generation of poets who are addressing all of these issues in their work, and not only addressing it, but addressing it with such artfulness that it cannot be ignored by the public. And so I feel like we're also um, in a kind of renaissance where people are paying a different kind of attention to poetry than they have for a long time. And we're seeing um, many more uh, writers of color who are publishing everywhere, winning major awards, which I only mention because it actually helps get the kind of attention that a writer needs. It helps to sell books. Um, it helps us to see them. I think because of that, because those are the writers that are, people are tuning into now, we're seeing stories that we haven't seen. Um, and they are mainstream and getting the attention as our American stories. Well, in the sheer scope and depth of what you just said, Natasha, I completely agree, although I'm not uh, a student of poetry the way you are. I, I, I uh, exploit poetry. I use it in my teaching, but I, I, I don't know what I'm, I just love certain poems, and I use them, mm -hmm. uh, including yours. Uh, uh, how many times I have quoted from Native Guard in, in lectures, especially the poem called Southern History. Yeah. Um, but. I suspect there have been times in the, and, and yes, this is a unique moment, that there is something unusual about this last eight to 10 years. And we can come back to that, because there have been some events that have put us here, without which we wouldn't be here probably. Mm -hmm. But I suspect if we went back to certain previous generations, whether that's in the 1920s and 30s, or that's in the 1890s, or that's the generation of the abolitionists uh, before the Civil War, the, the, the Civil War years, people might say, you think you're unique? <laughs> <laughs> you think you're unusual? Look what we're going through. Look what we went through. Uh, I do think sometimes we have a tendency to say, I mean, in artistic expression, there's no question. I mean, it's, it's almost always about what's so energetic and new. And hip hop has, God knows, I mean, changed all kinds of idioms. But this is, you know, name your, name your number of reckonings Americans have had with race. Uh, we started using the word reckoning again in the summer of 2020, maybe even before that, but especially that summer. And I often like to press on students to think about how many of these reckonings have we had? How, how do we periodize our reckonings? Uh, there have been eight or seven or six or 12, or is this the only reckoning? Um, 
And every reckoning we have, we want to be the last. Because we're human. We want to, our, our reckoning to be the last one. Why, why isn't it going to be over this time? And of course, it never is. Um, uh, this is an ongoing history. Uh, tragically, it's an ongoing history. And history always surprises us. The history of the past surprises us when we, when we find it. And then the history happening to us surprises us. So I agree, this, there, is, there, is, there, is a, there is a reckoning in the land. Uh, there, there are things happening in the land uh, on all kinds of levels, but sometimes we have to remember that almost everything has happened before, too. Um, lest we forget. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm thinking in particular uh, as well about the, the changes on, in public art, mm. uh, whether it's mm. those that uh, come from the ground up, so around the, uh, the site of George Floyd's murder, yeah. or the, uh, the, the new kinds of uh, memorials like the, uh, the, uh, the Embrace in Boston yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that has recently been done. Uh, do you see that as, as something new, or is it, that is, do you see more continuity? Or that is that a, uh, an, an expansion or a new direction in American public art? Well, I wish I were a, a more serious student of public art. I mean, I, I, like you, I can't go by a monument without mm -hmm. looking at it, investigating, and lo looking at the bottom for when it went up, the date. I want the date. I want the artist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not there. Um, and there, there surely aren't going to be any more equestrians. I think we can probably conclude that. <laughs> Horses are out. <laughs> darning going, and although uh, Sheffield told me today that the John B. Gordon statue in Atlanta is the only equestrian left in Atlanta or something. Mm. And who knows? John B. Gordon may, may, have, may have his days numbered. But God knows there's all kinds of exciting things happening with memorialization. And the Mellon Foundation just supported this massive project for the Washington Mall, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To just reimagine memorialization, reimagine monuments, to just, I guess these are going to be temporary exhibitions, right? Or maybe some will be permanent? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But the Mellon Foundation has supported this, what is it called? Reimagining memorialization? Beyond Granite. Beyond Granite. That, that's a great title, actually. Uh -huh. They didn't say beyond horses, it was beyond ground. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and God, who can't be for that? Let's reimagine this idea of what is a memorial? What is a monument? Uh, how do we redefine how we even think about it? Because some motifs in memorialization have lasted for centuries. Some haven't. That's worth knowing. Why? You know, which ones? You've thought about that too, I know. Mm -hmm. so. Well, yeah, I think um, <laughs> obviously w one of the things that I think that ends up being lasting is, um, you know, the, the monuments that we create in words. Yeah. Huh? And that's, you know, why I keep monument. going back to, to poetry because, you know, even as as you point out that um, there have been reckonings and we've always had these, you know, come to Jesus moments or whatever and, and then they go away and give way to the next one. What is different about this one? It, and it's probably things like what the Mellon Foundation is asking, but it's also that the people who are writing right now um, who, you know, uh, a previous generation would not have been able to get their books published. Mm -hmm. And so that those books are being published and out there, that feels like a different thing. I mean, publishing has had a reckoning mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, hashtag so white or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or hashtag publishing did this to me. Um, so that we are paying more attention to the monuments and words that writers are creating. I want, I, is it, are we allowed to just kind of? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Could we, ref, could you reflect a moment on this idea of, 
of the poem as monument or the poem as lasting, you know, synonyms for monument are not always simple, but I just used two poems this morning in my lecture in my course. It's the course on Civil War Reconstruction. I'm always using poems. Students kind of smile and laugh at me sometimes. Here he goes again. But I used two Melville poems um, from his battle pieces of Civil War poetry, the one called Wilderness, where he has a description of Ulysses Grant that is just unforgettable. This is unforgettable. And I happen to be, Grant was about six minutes of the lecture. So, I, And then I used his poem called The Martyr, which is his poem about the assassination of Lincoln, which is also unforgettable. It's just the stunning character of it, the anger in it. And I, th these were just part of my teaching, but there are some poems that are almost like putting up a picture mm -hmm. and saying, look at this language. Nobody captured that quite like that. Poems can be that way. Right, I mean, because... You write them all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't write poems. Well, I mean, because they are memorable. I mean, they're, they're, the, the musicality of them, um, that feeling of even as it's, it's a, a public act in so many ways, that feeling of intimacy that one has reading a poem as if it were written to speak directly to you. Yeah. Um, across time and space. Yeah. The first thing I ever memorized, and you may know this, was not a poem though, it was the Gettysburg Address. Ah, that's right, God. yeah. Because <laughs> it's a memorial, it is, and it is memorable and stirring. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's what stays with me. You know? It's and prose I can, poetry. Yeah. It's prose poetry. Right. And you know, those moments when you're just walking around and your mind needs something to land on it, to land on, I will land on that and just start reciting it in my head again. Ralph Waldo Emerson, I'm sorry, not Ralph, Ralph Waldo Ellison, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I always make that mistake. Ralph Ellison tells the story that it led to a famous essay he wrote. Um, he was in Rome on one of these American Institute fellowships trying to write a second novel, and he had a horrible nightmare, horrible, horrible nightmare. He wrote an essay after that about the nightmare. I don't have to go into that right now. But he said when he woke up, he was so disturbed the best way he could get himself relaxed was to start reciting the Gettysburg Address. I didn't know that. Well, that's kind of Ellison, too, you know? He was sort of, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's very moving when you think he's sitting in a, uh, over a piazza in Rome, you know, and he's had a bad night, and he's gonna recite the Gettysburg Address to relax. <laughs> <laughs> could have just had a drink or something. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I don't write poetry, but um, I mean, it's hard to talk about poetry. It'd be better off if we just heard some, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, but in poetry, every word counts. Yeah. That's what I love so much about it. Every word counts, and you're there with the writer in, in a great poem, especially historical poem. I'm, I'm always using historical poems primarily in my teaching, and I can see the poet stopping on every word, trying mm -hmm. to make that connection with me, mm -hmm. reader. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I never want to be the one saying, in in, in a poem. Want to do it again? Word, I'd be happy to do it again. Every <laughs> word matters. Every word counts in a different way than in prose. Um, no, I don't, but I don't want to be the one to say it. So I'm glad that you said it. Um, we do more transitions and conjunctions <laughs> and perhaps you can't do perhaps. That's right. Well, we could. We could. <laughs> um, I think that's what makes it memorable, though. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. concise. You know, um, it is that density and compression also that it's so much is being said in a single word.
or or a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that just means, an image. I, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you uh, about that since David's most recent big book, the biography of Frederick Douglass, uh, he he has called it a a biography of a voice, uh, of a man of words, uh, a master of metaphor. Um, so we have the great biographer of a master of metaphor, and but you've also talked about you talk. A great, I mean, I feel as though so much of Memorial Drive is about your, um, your learning metaphor and your education and metaphor. Um, that's the poet's strength too, isn't it? It's something that we as historians, we can't really do metaphor. We can talk about those who do it, but. Uh, we can try, but it's not. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> Best to leave it alone. Yeah. But of course, you know, all language is metaphor. Yeah. You know, we're, okay. we're constantly dealing, something. yeah, in metaphor. And, you know, the way I talk about it, as you're, as you're referring to from my book, you know, learning, you know, getting my proper poetical education in the metaphor, which is something my father was intent on teaching me, because the language is so metaphorical. And as Robert Frost points out, if you don't understand metaphor, you're not safe anywhere. You're not safe in science, you're not safe in history. And I think for me, on a deeply personal level, coming to a grasp of metaphor helped me contend with growing up in a white supremacist society in which all the metaphors were rooted in um, the white mind of the South rooted in a kind of supremacy that would have been deeply destructive to my humanity if I didn't understand metaphor. And couldn't and turn it back to, to your own purposes. Mm -hmm. And words, correct me if I'm wrong, words become a weapon to do that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can wield those words back on whatever the target. Right. Um, there's a line in a Robert Penn Warren, I'm a big Robert Penn Warren fan. Sorry if any of you. Me too. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> I, I knew that. I, I knew I could get away with it. Said that. <laughs> but um, he was both poet and novelist and historian. He, he wrote everything. There's a, a, a throwaway single line in a, in a, in a Warren poem it's, a, it's one of those poems he wrote about growing up in Tennessee and wandering the hills, which is a lot of his poems. But he says, history, it's the thing you can't resign from. Mm. And it's just one of those lines, you know, that all great poets have, will have a lot of them. You do. It's just, God, he nailed it. Mm -hmm. You think you can, you, we want to. We want to live above history. We want to, you know, we can write pages and pages and pages about how we deny history, we want to live above history, we want to get over history. Why can't we forget? And we do. We write pages and pages on that. That one line tells us what history is. It's the thing that will be there. It's coming for you. It's never gone. Even when you deny it and ignore it, it's still there. You can't resign from it. And that's what you poets do. You have those moments where it's just single phrase, there's no dependent clause, there's nothing, it's just a declarative phrase. It's a definition of history. I often play in, in, in undergraduate seminars with students, so what is history? You know, and I trot out six or eight of my favorite definitions of what is history from this historian and that historian. But sometimes I just go to Warren or a couple other poets and say, well, what about this? Because sometimes the poets get it better than we do. Maybe usually the poets get it better than we do. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I just wanted to throw Robert Penn. I might get Warren in here one more time. I'm we're thinking not, we if should. If we're not careful. Yeah. <laughs> do you read history? Of course. I, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't write the poems that I write if I didn't read history. So, yeah. so well, why, why, how does history inform your, your writing or inform your understanding? Well, I mean, I, I, I look for evidence 
first of all, I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, historians are giving us, you know, um, analysis through uh, evidence. And I've always been drawn to documentary evidence um, to make sense of, um, you know, the, the world that I found myself in. So, you know, if, if poetry, if what poets are doing is, is um, documenting, in a sense, or recording the cultural memory of a people, because the poem is made in a particular moment and is responding to uh, the poet's place in that world, in that particular moment, it becomes a, 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 an object of, of you know, material culture to sort of understand and to record that. The historians are also doing that. Um, I mean, I, I, I think of it like that, you know? Um, also responding to the contemporary moment, um, but reaching into the, the, the evidence and into the archives to give us that analysis. And I think the two of them together can tell us so much about not only you know, where we've been, but where we're headed. You know, a lot of you know this because you're Trethaway fans. She even has footnotes <laughs> on some of her poems. I footnote David Blight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got that in there. I was blown away when I, it's the only time I've ever been footnoted by a poet. Someone told me about it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's in Native Guard. Somebody said, oh, it was my friend Peter Allman who said, have you read Native Guard yet? He said, yeah, I have it, I have it, I just got it. He says, you're not gonna believe this. She footnotes you. I said, oh, come on. You know. Anyway, poets don't have to footnote anybody. Uh, we do. But you know, when, when, <laughs> when you're a poet trying to write about history, um, trying to do what you do, yeah. um, but in a poem, uh, it, and particularly for me, I wanted to, even as I was imagining characters, even as I was imagining a soldier who might have been, right. I could only imagine him from documentary evidence. Like he, he was created from the documentary evidence. But because it was important for me to try to, in poems, do what professional historians are doing, mm -hmm. you know, which is to, to tell us about these histories, mm -hmm. many of which are, um, at least to a lot of lay people, uh, forgotten, unknown, mm -hmm. uh, unheard of, mm -hmm. un, unrecognized on the monumental landscape, or at least when I say unrecognized, even if a monument has been created, they may not have interacted with it, for example. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted to do that work, I, I wanted a, a reader to understand that it was rooted in actual history, actual evidence, oh. um, and without footnotes, I mean, my poets can get away with it, but it also can mean that no one has to believe it. See, this is, to me, fascinating because, so are you saying then that to get to the interior life of that soldier or whomever you're trying to represent, you need, I don't want to use the term real history, um, you, you need some kind of evidence rather than just the imagination although it is an act of imagination, powerful imagination, the history gives you what? Authenticity? Details? Yeah, the authenticity of, the, of detail, of uh, voice. Okay. I mean, yeah. so reading letters that soldiers were yeah. writing, yeah. reading uh, newspaper articles, reading Walt Whitman, you know, in the Picayune, uh, reading who saw the Native Guards. I mean, reading... Yeah. Those, that kind of evidence, the diary of, of someone. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know who else does that? Uh, your fellow poet, Tracy Smith. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. she, she's you and, oh. 
Yeah, anyway. <laughs> she read, yeah, a lot of letters she read. Um, to for do that, her, For yeah. Wade in the Water. Wade yeah. in the Water, mm -hmm. yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I don't know how to call it. I mean, historians are always wandering around looking for respect, I think, or something. <laughs> I don't know, um, but you know, bo both are acts of imagination. Mm -hmm. Historians have imagination. Mm -hmm. The historians you might like best for their writing or their subjects even probably are inspiring you with some imagination in the way they put the story together, the way they put their evidence together, mm -hmm. the, the way they've constructed uh, you know, what everyone now wants to call frameworks for their work and so on. So it's but it's two different kinds of imagination that can draw on one another. Um, at least that's the way I've always seen it. I had no training in literature or poetry. I just, I wish I had. I wish I'd, I don't know, maybe I wouldn't have, maybe I'd be writing poetry and I'd just, I'd be poor and have no You're doing job. pretty well, isn't it, the way, you, the way you're going? No, I mean, it, but it's two different kinds of imagination. I mean, we run into obvious roadblocks. We, I can't go there. Right. I don't have any evidence. Or you wish you could, though. Ooh. And then that's when I can step in. Oh, <laughs> I know. That's why we're envious, yeah. you know, of so many places I wish I could take you with Frederick Douglass that I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But there are a few poets who have, mm -hmm. about Douglass, even. So, anyway. Well, I, you know, I think what we do as historians, or what I love, is the ability to bring information together into a story. To craft it in a story, to see connections, to to uh, to produce a narrative from, or to see a narrative that others don't see. Yeah. And for me, that's that's the excitement of it. Um, and to produce a narrative at all, we do have a tendency in academia now, in some precincts. Well, I shouldn't do that. To write without narrative, to write with only theoretical concerns, forgetting that. Real people don't read that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, this is sort of why I brought up the, the need Sorry. for, you know, evidence and footnotes, because, <laughs> I mean, there is a, a, a backstory. I mean, um, after Native Guard came out, I, I was on the news hour with Jeff Brown, mm. and um, he was, you know, asking me about historical memory mm. and historical erasure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that things are forgotten um, because they may not be inscribed on our monumental landscape. They may not be in all of our textbooks. There's so many ways that kind of erasure happens. So I was talking about it. We start talking about the Native Guards. And then um, I get lots of email mm -hmm. from people telling me things like, well, if they were, you know, if they really existed, they would be in the National Archives. They, well, they, they thought you'd made all this they up. They thought I'd made it all up. And of course, they are in the National Archives, <laughs> but they thought I'd made it all up. Because you're a poet. Because I'm a poet. And that means they could dismiss it. So it's not only that they thought I'd made it all up because I was a poet, but also they'd never heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, then I'll get an email from, you know, one professional historian who may go unnamed who, uh, who didn't know that he was footnoted in the book and was, I think, annoyed as, that I was talking about this as if this were this completely buried history, mm. which I wasn't doing. Mm. Um, no, you weren't. Uh, but again, you know, he's operating as a historian, knowing that professional historians are writing about all sorts of things, mm. but missing the slippage where I'm talking about, but there are plenty of people who don't know about it. There are plenty of people who don't know because the monuments, for example, in the Deep South, seem to tell one story and not another. And you know, it hasn't been that long. If we, I know, I'm the oldest one in the room, maybe. I don't I know, Rand, Randy Burkett's here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's not fair. Um, but. Okay, um, sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> we, we do need to remember that um, th 
these things have happened before. We have faced these things before. Uh, uh, but it's only how many years ago? How do you want to date this? Mm -hmm. When nobody thought any Confederate monument would ever go down, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, don't, I, I can only speak for myself. I, I, I must have publicly said 15 times, mm -hmm. Monument Avenue will always be there. Say whatever you want about it, it's always going to be there. Such and such, say what you want about it, it's always going to be there. And no, it isn't. So we've learned, this is unique about this moment. We have learned something here about never saying never. Because there are events, <laughs> events are going to happen we don't know yet. We, we couldn't know about Emmanuel A. M. E until June of 15. We couldn't know about Charlottesville until it happened. We couldn't know about George Floyd until it happened. And yet, who, who, we're still coping with the election of Mr. Trump and Trumpism and all that has flowed from that. And we're living with it yet. So uh, this is what fascinates me so much about going back to this historical moment. Um, for one thing, it's not over by any means. And yet, it happened in ways no one believed it would. Uh, it's a little bit like nobody predicting 9-11, uh, um, or the end of the Cold War. Who predicted that? If you did, you were ahead of the curve. Um, and we're in this business every day. We're in the business of knowledge creating and helping people understand where we are. How many times have you been called by the press Asking, so how do we get here? <laughs> and my deadline was an hour ago. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, we are creatures of events sometimes, often, that we not only can't control, we don't see them coming. And it repositions us. So you don't think then that the, the good people here at, at Atlanta History Center are, are um, are tilting at windmills and, and going after Stone Mountain. I mean, oh, that's a setup. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, they're not. I mean, uh, my goodness, Sheffield and his staff. I haven't seen the film yet, but I'm going to the website tonight, Sheffield. Promise, wherever you are. Uh, there you are. Um, and moving the cyclorama here. And by the way, I love this place. I did research here back in the 1990s on Lost Cause stuff, uh, and then been thrilled to come back. But no, you're not, you're not tilting at windmills, not now. You might have been 10 years ago. Your board might never let you do it 10 years ago, or this or that, I don't know. Um, that's what's amazing about this moment, whether you're a poet, a historian, a public historian, or just an, an interested citizen. Um, you know, the, the times they are changing, and every hour, every day. Uh, maybe I'm too much of a news junkie, but um, the past is unstable. You know that line, the past is unpredictable? But we want it to be settled. We want it to stay put. <laughs> we want it to be what it was to all those people you grew up around mm -hmm. who, who are now so unsettled so disturbed, they've lost their past. Mm -hmm. they, the, 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 there are many grievances out there in America, but one of the deepest ones is history ain't what it used to be. <laughs> and uh, it ain't your granddaddy's civil war anymore. It ain't your whatever's reconstruction anymore. Um, that's the fight. It's always that. And who doesn't want to live in a, in a story that makes you feel good? If you've, got a, if you've got a narrative that you can tell your children and you learned it from your parents and grandparents and it makes you sleep well at night. Who Justify all sorts of stuff that sure. you do. Yeah. You know, and you can go to it when you need, it's that well you can go to when you need a little justification. Mm -hmm. uh, who wouldn't want that, you know? It's much harder to, to say, you know, trouble my past, go ahead. Go ahead, History Center. Trouble your past. It's, uh, it's not easy. It's e 
Baldwin, James Baldwin has a line worth taking to the bank it, where it was about 1962. He said, the trouble with the way Americans use the past is that they use the past to cover up the sleeper but never to wake him up. I've always loved that metaphor because you know, we, we want a past that helps us sleep at night, not one that gives us nightmares or troubles us. Um, of course, that, that was Baldwin, too. He was always using history to trouble his readers. So, I don't, I forget what the question was. I went off the <laughs> well, well, Sorry. Thinking about uh, Stone Mountain, and, you know, I had mentioned to you both that... Oh, Tilting Windmill, that's right. Yeah, that I, um, that, that a colleague at Morehouse and I took our classes to Stone Mountain to see the laser show so a few years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, and that um, Andrew Young, welcomed us. He was part of the, the laser, laser show, welcoming us to Stone Mountain. And um, I was surprised uh, at how, you know, I, we've all wrestled with the question of what, of what, that, what that was telling us about um, the history of the city hmm. and, and how people regarded that that monument had it been domesticated and neutered to such an extent, or I mean, do we have to reawaken people to the to its history the way the the video does, which I recommend. And it has footnotes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I I think we have to do both things. Um, I think you know, as David said earlier, you know, some of us are just prone to look at every monument and engage with it um, so that it has a life every time someone interacts with it. Um, but at the same time, I, I think you have a lot of people, um, and I could say this perhaps for myself as well, I mean, growing up, I used to go out to Stone Mountain, you know? Um, it's, when I was in high school, Stone Mountain was the place that teenagers would get in their cars and cruise. It's always had that big monument there. But for some of us, I think it just, for me in particular, it just becomes part of the backdrop of every single thing. That is always there for me. The Confederacy and the Lost Cause ideology looms large in my life. You know, I was born on Confederate Memorial Day. There's no way for me to escape it. But it is the backdrop against which I've had to live my entire life. So am I always seeing it? Sometimes it's nice just to not have to see it. So instead, I might look at a laser show projected against it and see that instead of what is always just behind it. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, I'm curious about my own attitudes toward monuments over time. As a kid, I used to beg my parents to, this is too much information, but I used to beg my parents to take me out east. I grew up in Michigan, so if you went east, it was out east to historic sites. And my dad was interested mostly because he spent all of World War II in Washington, D.C., and he could go show me things in Washington, which I loved. But I wanted to see historic sites, battlefield sites, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know what all those monuments meant to me as a kid, except it was extraordinary. It was just these landscapes full of these monuments and memorials. Then I started reading Bruce Catton. I've come out of the closet. I've, I've told the world now for more than a decade that I grew up on Bruce Catton. In academia, you've got to be careful to admit that. Uh, it's like admitting you're a card-carrying fantasy football fan in the history department or something, which I'm not. But with time, though, these monuments became a subject. I think for so many people, they're just there. For some of us who end up writing about these things, study, teaching, they're more than that. They become a subject. They're an object, but they're a subject now. Why are they there? What do they mean? I remember early on in the 
memory business in the 90s, a panel somewhere, I don't remember where it was, we were beginning to talk a lot about historical memory in the 1990s. Um, and one, I don't even know who it was enough, somebody on the panel said to the audience, can you think of a monument that deeply moved you even to weep? Have you ever been to a monument that deeply moved you even to weep? as opposed to most monuments, which you just go by every day, or you don't even know what it is. Now, that's in the 90s. You probably wouldn't ask that question quite the same way right now. <laughs> but it was an interesting question. You ever wept at a monument just by seeing it? You have, OK. Lincoln. The Lincoln Memorial. Very possible. It's, 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 it's aesthetics. Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah, I've, been, I've only been there once, but oh, my goodness. Yes. The Vietnam Memorial. The Vietnam Memorial, especially if you're a certain age mm -hmm. and you find your high, school but, your high school friend's name. I mean, that's just there but for the grace of God go I and all of that. Um, sure, there are others. But sometimes aesthetically some monuments are just not artistic, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't do anything to us until we know the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, my own favorite monument in the universe is Augusta St. Gordon's Shaw Memorial, 54th Massachusetts Memorial in Boston. Part of it is because it's such a magnificent work of art. It's just an almost unbelievable work of art. What he captured in a foot and a half, half depth of a bar relief is just, it's just unbelievable. Um, on the other hand, it's really the story that's moving. When you know the story with the art, uh, I love going to that monument, especially with students or with teachers and just trying to get them to get inside of the story. But, um, our landscape is dotted with all kinds of monuments, but it's interesting. Those of you who are young in the audience are going to live many decades where this business of monument making may become very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, very different. Aesthetically, politically, I don't know. It's very hard to predict. In fact, we shouldn't predict, probably. I'm, I'm interested in, in what you were saying about, you know, getting your folks to take you to these historic sites and not knowing exactly why or when you got interested in the monuments and when they began to say things to you, you know, that interaction that we have. I don't know that about myself either. Mm. You know, when I think about it, you know, and, and, and having written a little bit about it, everything from you know, doing rubbings of graves, because I was oh, very yeah. interested in that when I was very young, oh, you know, yeah. the names of the dead and their dates. Well, you which, went and rubbed yeah, them? Yeah, I would, you know, go and look at it. But, you know, <laughs> early on, having an understanding of at least who was on what side in the Civil War, very <laughs> basic. Mm -hmm. But I was a little kid when I understood that, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, I found the copy of a, of a biography of Ulysses S. Grant in my little school library when I'm like in the fifth grade or something, mm. fourth or fifth grade, and then I'm carrying it around with me. Mm. Because something already was teaching me. Mm. And I have to believe it was something on the monumental landscape. Mm. It was everything from the flag, you know, to some monument that maybe I just read as opposed to simply walking by it. Mm. And I do, I think you're right, a, a lot of people just walk by them. Um, you know, when Native Guard came out, somebody reviewed it, and one of the problems that they had with it was about its, a, its interest in monuments and memorialization because the writer said that, you know, monuments are static, you know, no mm. one. But, mm. and that, I thought, at that time, what a privilege that these monuments aren't sending a message to you. Yeah, that you can they call sure them static. are sending one to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For whom are yeah. they static? Yeah. And why mm -hmm. are they static? Mm -hmm. 
A monument is always, isn't it? Partly its meaning is always when it was unveiled, mm -hmm. why, by whom. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why we now go back to all these monument unveiling speeches at all the hundreds and hundreds of Confederate monuments between 1890 and 1920. So it's always, its meaning is always about when it was put up, but then over time. What has it meant to other generations, other people? Who did it represent and not represent? What was it a message about, to whom? I mean, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting, right? And you went through more of these than I did. It was interesting after, well, after Charleston. Ch Charleston is the marker. Uh, there were plenty of other markers, but the ses sesquicentennial, sesquicentennial of the Civil War comes to an end in the spring of 2015, and in June, the massacre at Emanuel, AME. And then, you know, flags come down, and a monument here and a monument there. Um, Governor Haley gets all this credit for taking the flag down, but she, she didn't rescind the, I'm sorry, but she didn't <laughs> rescind the voter ID law in South Carolina at that point, which she sponsored. Um, but, you know, now we, we were suddenly looking at every, everything Confederate. And, Nobody has a Confederate landscape quite like Sewanee, I mean, at least for a university. And, and, and lest we forget here, what you're doing. I, mean, I, I went there first, actually, confession. My first visit to Sewanee was the first public lecture I gave after my heart surgery, and it was, it was a test for me. I thought, can, can I do this? Oh my God, <laughs> can I stand on my feet and do this? So I, I'm always, you don't know this, but I'm always grateful to Suwannee because I actually was able to stand up and speak. But my goodness, the whole room, the whole building was about Confederate memory. And uh, I think you asked me to speak on the 14th Amendment, uh -huh. and I, which, which was good. I wasn't there to talk about Confederate monuments, thank God. But my goodness now, we don't think the same about all things Confederate. Why? Because some events happened that everyone had to reposition themselves to. People have been writing about this for a long time in mm -hmm. poetry and prose and so on, mm -hmm. uh, for years and years and years. But it's, it fascinates me how two or three, usually violent events, it's unfortunate but true, usually violent events reposition us on these matters. Um, is, that, is that a failure on our part, some failure in our uh, political imagination that it takes that kind of horrific, uh, violent injustice to shake the chains loose a little bit? Probably, but it has probably been there since the garden, I mean, we have many deep flaws as this human species, and one of them is we don't like to face our past. I mean, who's really good at it? Well, some countries have been actually better at it than others, some cultures, some peoples, uh, for different kinds of reasons, that's worth studying. I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions, but just <clears throat> quickly a story that I had. I, I visited uh, with a class, uh, uh, the church in Charleston, in the summer of 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and they took us through the heavily secured door now mm -hmm. into the basement of the church. And there was um, like a women's group having their weekly luncheon there in the basement, uh, and they were mostly older women, retired women, and they welcomed us in and offered to share their food and everything, and uh, they were very friendly and, 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 and sweet, and it was, um, it was a very uh, positive encounter, but, and then they, then they said, this is where the massacre occurred, right here where they were sitting, where their tables were set up. So, 
and which stunned me, and I think everyone else, that there's nothing marking it there. There's no evidence that it happened there, except that they were determined to go on with the life of the church as it had always been. And I wonder if that was a kind of memorial. That's a kind of um, the determination to, uh, uh, to continue what you've always done. Um, so it was very deeply moving to me and to the students. tell you, because they didn't have to tell you. No. So it's not just, I think, that they are um, occupying that space and carrying on, but they're carrying on the memory by passing it on to someone who visits, to, to keep telling it. Mm -hmm. You know, a monument is memory. Yeah, so to, te to keep telling it. I remember being at Emanuel AME the year, after, the year after and then the second year after at, at various event, you know, events, and one of which was the, what used to be the John Lewis Civil Rights Pilgrimage. Instead of going to Selma, Montgomery, it was in 17, I think, or eight, 17 or 18, they decided to go to Charleston. And I had the privilege of going on that. And oh my goodness, yeah. Um, we met many of the family members of people who were killed. And it's, it's difficult for many Americans who don't live as deeply a religious life as some of these people do to understand their sense of forgiveness. There's a very Christian sense of forgiveness that was going on there, and if, you, if you're not and somehow connected to that tradition, you may not get it, because they can't they can't mourn without some forgiving. And but it's a yeah, it's a marker in our history now. It's a heck of a book to be written by one of you uh, on this era at some point, I don't know when is the right time to write it, but America, since the sesquicentennial of emancipation and the Civil War, and then line up your markers over time, uh, events, political events, and so on, and, and how we've reshaped ourselves, or have we, you know? There are going to be a lot of books to be written about this period. It's too early, but some of you are going to write those. <laughs> so, questions? You've already got Claire. a question back here. Yeah, sorry. Back. Thank you, Natalie. Especially Wait, one moment, ma'am. We want to get you on the recording, so use the mic. But I'm going to say, with great affection for the audience, if we could keep questions succinct and with a question mark. Then I'll make sure that we're able to get it to as many people as possible. Okay, just quick question for Natalie. Natasha. Uh -huh. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you spoke of memory, you spoke of metaphor, you spoke of growing up. You left and you've returned. Welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> has that jarred? your sense of your history? Is there a poet in coming back here? Um, hmm. Well, it, you know, it, it's hard to, to feel that I've really left um, because as a, as a writer, the Deep South, this is still the place that made me. And it, it is still the place that, um, shapes the way that I, I see everything. And it is always the, the bedrock and the foundation of my thinking and my writing. So even if I live in Cole, Chicago, you know, my, my psyche, you know, um, my sense of psychological exile, if you will, is rooted in the fact of being a native Southerner, always. So I take that home with me everywhere I go. All right. 
Thank you very much. That was interesting and enlightening. As an Italian-born philosopher, I realized that I have to rethink everything I thought I knew about what it means for something to be a monument. Now, I, well, my colleague and friend and I live in a town called Lubbock in West Texas. Lubbock is the name of a Confederate general. He, and I don't even know how many people in Lubbock know this, but would Lubbock be a monument? What is a monument? I apologize. Well, I love this one. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I mean, I think anything that sort of calls to mind a memory of something. Um, and embedded in the name of that place is a memory of something. So it is connecting us to a particular past, if you know it, as you do, and pay attention to it, you know? Um, I love the fact that uh, if you look up in the OED, an ant mound is also a monument. The ants... What they build, you know, a mound, is also a monument. Um, and so this is why I have a, a, my last book of poems was called Monument, about a particular poem in it that is a poem about ants building a monument <coughs> on my mother's grave. They're building the thing that I hadn't built there yet. Um, but their act of building that mound, that monument, reminded me. So it is an act of something that makes us remember. You know, and every, every place has a history. But you only know it if you learn it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What should be done with the Lost Cause monuments, in your opinion, and contrast that with how Germany has dealt with uh, hol Holocaust kind of memorials? Um, I lived in Germany for a year and been there many times. Um, I think I, the question was what should be done with Lost Cause monuments? And well, you've got a lot of options. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're not doing nothing anymore. <laughs> witness the Robeson Project <laughs> at Sewanee, witness the Atlanta History Center, witness uh, monuments, Confederate, all things Confederate are under some duress. I'll just say a quick word on Germany. Um, I, w I spent a year in a Fulbright uh, fellowship in Munich in 92, 93 which was only a couple, two years after the wall had gone down, two and three years. It was an extraordinary time to be in Germany and had the privilege of going to East Germany several times and other parts of Eastern Europe. Again, it's one of those moments when people felt like history had just fundamentally changed. Nothing would ever be the same again. Um, Cold War was over. The wall came down. Everything, if you were of a certain age, you had identified with Europe, post-war Europe, uh, was now going to all be different. Now we know that some things became very different, very different, but some didn't. Germany, however, is a model for the world, to be quite frank, in facing its past. It hasn't always done it. It took time. Uh, but frankly, no country with, let's be honest, one of the most troubled pasts you can imagine, and one of the greatest crimes a nation state ever committed, uh, has faced that past at historic site after historic site after historic site. I went to at least six or seven Holocaust sites, former death camps. It was, and I went... You know, you got to have some proposal when you get Fulbright. My proposal was to write some comparative essay on American memory of the Civil War and German memory of the Third Reich or something. I never wrote that essay. <laughs> it was way too hard, too difficult. <laughs> oh, and I still don't read German quite well enough. Uh, I don't. But anyway, 
Germany faced its past, I think, better than any country in modern history because it had to. The Cold War forced it to. Um, the West forced it to, West Germany. Now, you got a realization of that by going to the East at that time because Eastern Germany had been the German, Demo German Democratic Republic, the uh, communist regime of East Germany. Their Holocaust sites were completely different than the West. The interpretations were completely opposite. And most of them were still there in 92, 93. They've now been all fundamentally changed. Um, there, there's a, a whole array of books on this uh, about German memory and how the Germans have faced the past. And, and then with the reunification and the move of their capital to Berlin, you know, Berlin has become, God, a site of memory. It always was a site of memory, but a site of memory almost like no other. Part of that now is, is its commercialization. But I'll never forget going to Germany to teach that year. And I taught a course with German students comparing the memory of the American Civil War and the memory of the Third Reich and the Second World War and the Holocaust. I thought, I'm going to do it, man. I'm going to try it. And students were really into it. But a lot of the German students had to let me know, Mr. American Professor, is it possible for an American to ever come to Germany or to Munich without asking about the Holocaust first? You know, I had to learn how to step lightly on some of these things. But it's a generational problem among Germans, too. It's a complicated, crazy story, but I love the question because uh, Germany is a model. Japan didn't have to face its past the way Germany did. And there's a whole scholarship on why Japan didn't face its past. Um, part of that is because they experienced two atomic bombs. They could be victims forever if they chose to be. And uh, this is another whole thing in any consideration of memory and forgetting. Who can claim victimhood? What is victimhood? Hi, um, thank you so much for tonight. Um, I'm gonna do the predictable digital historian thing and ask a question about the internet. Um, and you talked about this a little bit before with the reckoning and publishing and how that's been tied to hashtags. And I just wanted to see if any of you had an opinion on how the internet or social media has affected memorialization and this particular time and period around memorialization and the reckoning with our history. Natasha's a lot younger, so she, she, she knows that. <laughs> she can do that. You know, I'm not on social media either. <laughs> so, um, Really? Can you answer that? Mm, I'm not, no, y'all are the ones. Ah. Um, Go ahead. I, <laughs> well, I steadfastly avoided Twitter. I would never, ever, ever get on Twitter, I said, until the morning after Trump held his so-called history conference at the National Archives, where they announced that 1776 project in September 2020, and profaned the National Archives that day. The next day I got on Twitter, just to have something to say about that. And then I stayed on for a while and made a fool of myself. But. Uh, I wish I understood. Yeah. I mean, the greatest test now is AI, the chat GPT, and all the other versions of it. I asked one of my senior essays, senior thesis students the other day, a couple weeks ago, they're finishing their senior theses. And I just said, uh, do you go on this chat GPT thing? Which I've never done. I mean, are students doing that was my question. And I trust this student. He's, he's wonderful. He says, oh, yeah, I've been on it. I said, well, what do you do on it? <laughs> he says, oh, I put my topic in. Oh, yeah? What'd you get? <laughs> Have I read that? Because <laughs> he just gave me the draft. 
He said, no, 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 I didn't use any of it. But he said, yeah, it came back with a pretty good, a pretty good short essay. Mm -hmm. So I thought, and I know a lot of you are way ahead of me in understanding this now, but that's our future. Machines can write, machines can create, machines can invent, machines can, apparently we're gonna have machine medicine. So, I'll that's not the internet, man, that's way beyond the internet. <laughs> I'll be convinced when they can write a poem. Well, no, I know, yeah, I, know. <laughs> I know, I know. I have a it colleague. It's probably dumb who, rhymes or something. Well, yeah, I have a colleague who wanted to show me that uh, that the uh, it, the Chat GP, whatever it's called, could write a poem, yeah. and so he put in. He asked it of all things to write an elegy. <laughs> <laughs> With you know, it has no feelings, but it was supposed to write an elegy, and mm. and it wrote a a rhyming poem about a death. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, God. It was not an elegy. It was not good. <laughs> so well, I what? feel safe for a little while longer. <laughs> Poets may be the, the last ones holding out in the dark recesses of a library, still feeling good about themselves. <laughs> the rest of us will be jumping off Stone Mountain or something. Uh, well, one more question, maybe? Yeah, thank you. I'm curious about, I've had some experience talking to organizations about changing monuments. And when people are resistant, they come up with all kinds of arguments against why you should not change these things. One of the more interesting ones is about culture. And they just point out that the cultures of the past were not what they are today. And the Wilmot Proviso is as much a white supremacist document as, as a anti-slavery document. And um, oh. Millennials had the experience of watching TV shows we thought were hilarious in the early 90s, and it turns out they're pretty homophobic, sexist, racist, all those things. And so I guess the question, just as you think about this, is how do you, how do you respond to people who said, you know, the cultures of the past were different, and we shouldn't judge those cultures by our standards? You know, um Many years ago, uh, what I, some of you will remember when um, Georgia was going through um, the process of changing the flag, mm -hmm. the state flag, you, you remember. So I, I remember back then um, reading uh, something in the newspaper, uh, an opinion, uh, letter to the editor. Someone wrote that uh, all true Southerners love that flag. <laughs> so, you know, with a statement like that, it, it just completely erases, you know, uh, me as a true Southerner who does not love that flag. Um, and I remember that, uh, you know, um, people were making this kind of cultural or heritage argument about that particular flag. And then finally reading someone trying to make sense of it who was trying to inform the public about how that flag came to be, why we had that flag, hmm. such that the original flag, maybe in 1896, was a Confederate flag. But the flag that we were at the point of trying to vote to get rid of was the flag established in response to Brown v. Board of Education. So it was a flag meant to say something about that. That's why that one was erected. So now, um, at the moment of trying to, that, I think that's a good sort of metaphor for thinking about um, learning exactly why the monument was erected at that particular time. And we can know these things. We can know if uh, based on, you know, as David was saying, what the date was, who commissioned it, what the speeches were, what it was in response to, if these things were in response to something and they were particularly a monument meaning to say, for example, white supremacy now, white supremacy forever. This is why we're putting it up. If that's the reason they put it up at that moment, we can judge them for exactly their own evidence of why they did it. And I think that's a monument that we could say, maybe we could take that one down. Or maybe we can move it to the graveyard. Or maybe we can tell the whole story 
about why it's there. So I think the problem is when people just think, oh, that's my heritage you're taking down. Well, let's talk about what your heritage was about mm. and why this particular monument was erected. That's how you answer it, I think. Well, that's well said. I, I'm, Connor is my PhD student at Yale, so I'll disclosure it. <laughs> but he also was, is one of the chief architects of this renaming process for the military bases. Mm. Ten of them? Nine, I'm sorry. They all were named from Confederates, so he's, he's deep into this. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we go back and understand that culture but change the names? Uh, I'll just say this. Uh, as historians, we often encounter this in faraway times for sure, sometimes even in more recent times. I have the, shall I say, terrible privilege right now of writing uh, Yale's history mm. with slavery and abolition, both stories. I was asked about two and a half years ago by the president of Yale, would I consider managing and putting together Yale's history with slavery? And I had about a minute to answer. So that's what I'm doing. And I am encountering this all the time. Yale is 320 some years old. And some of those 18th century Puritans were, they lived in another world. There's just no question about it. They lived in a universe defined extremely different from us. Jonathan Edwards is still possibly America's greatest theologian. But he owned two slaves most of his adult life. And he would go over to Newport, Rhode Island and buy them. So what do you do with that? Uh, Benjamin Silliman, who, I mean, I have to, I've had to get to know all these people. <laughs> and live with them. Benjamin Silliman's one of the greatest American scientists. He brought science into universities, et cetera, et cetera. He's really important for that. Uh, he was a slave owner briefly, got rid of him, but, that, but more importantly, he ran a huge research project that, well, huge for that time, in the early republic. This is the 18-teens, 1820s. He had a staff of people who went down to the Mississippi Valley to study sugar production. I mean, they really did a scientific study of how you produce sugar. And we have these letters where Solomon's writing to his, his assistants saying, learn everything you can about the slave system, about black people, about how this system functions, but don't tell anybody we're doing it. Which is kind of a definition of Yale. <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> no, I love teaching. I didn't go there, so I don't carry any valises for them. <laughs> but I love teaching there. It's a, it's a tremendous university. It has some of the greatest libraries and museums in the world and great colleagues. It's a great university. But let's go, let's go do this. Let's go study this. Let's go collect on this. Just don't tell anybody we're doing it. It's going to be the epigraph on the book. That quote. I, I don't have the exact quote with me right now. Samuel Morse, for God's sake, is so flaming racist, he invented the telegraph. There's a college name for them. There's scholarships named for them. I don't know what they're going to That's not that's above my pay grade. I don't have to decide what to do with Samuel Morse's name. But Woodrow Wilson. God, Woodrow Wilson at Princeton, <laughs> and on and on and on and on. But you, you, well, Yale already handled the Calhoun problem, but there are many, many other, these are, they often are people from another time. They truly are. And how do you make those judgments is the problem of managing public memory in an institution. I think sometimes these decisions become easier than others, but everyone who has to make them at the institutional level the city level, the state level, the whatever level, I think one of the things we've learned through this is that we need principles. We need guidelines about how we do this. And uh, last thing, I mean, when, when Yale had to, when Yale had a reckoning right after Charleston. In fact, the reason Yale had a reckoning about John C. Calhoun College, which was 82 years old at that point, 
the John C. Calhoun. There was a residential college named for Calhoun. And they all called themselves the Hoonies. And all kinds of iconography about Calhoun and stained glass windows about Calhoun in this Yale college. The president announced that we were going to have a discussion as a university about the name on that college in the fall of 2015. And we did for a whole year. Hey. And then it kind of blew it at first by not renaming it after kind of saying they were going. Anyway, you don't need to know all that. But what finally the, the president, Peter Salovey, did, and he got it right this time, he pointed a committee to simply study the process. Woody knows all about this. The process by which an institution would rename anything. How do you come up? What are some principles? How have other places done it? What process should you go through? And I was on that committee. And I had to do a mea culpa, because at the beginning of that committee, I told the other 12 members, I said, I don't think we can really come up with these principles. They ought to just rename it. <laughs> I said, just do it. I kept saying, just do it. No. Principles, we're a university. We're about knowledge. And he was right. I was wrong. We met for six months. We looked at this and looked at that and studied this and studied that. And we came up with three principles mm -hmm. that whenever, at least in other places of model this to some extent, whenever Yale has to face a renaming now, it's got three principles to put that name through. And uh, it may not always work, but you need some guidelines. And I'm sure your renaming process, Connor, for the Pentagon was using a variety of principles. Um, Is treason one of them? Treason. They actually used the word. <laughs> Good. No, they did. In fact, that project, we just did a session at the, OA, the Organization of American Historians on this. I, that project has brought the word treason back into our, maybe Sewanee is too, I don't know. But you all brought treason back into our lexicon. Uh, because I, it used to be, you know, you just didn't bring that up mm. at conferences on the Civil War was, did Lee commit treason? You just don't go there. We're even beyond that now. He did. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, um, I hate to bring everything uh, to a close <laughs> here. I will say that uh, for the, this conference this weekend, we were initially thinking about calling it Monumental Challenges but we changed that <laughs> to monumental opportunities um, to get that sense of possibility and hope. And I think certainly your work, David, and your student, Natasha, is part of the reason why we do. We have hope. We have, uh, we have determination. So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs>